Good morning, everybody. Well, that's me. This is a wolf, and uh, we know that in Europe, the wolf is uh, recolonizing former habitat, and that raises concerns amongst the public. <coughs> and it's also an emotional issue, so we are taught. So which emotion do you think is most relevant, which human emotion, when it comes to the wolf? If I ask you this question, I'm sure I'm not going to check. I did that many times in the past in different uh, audiences. 95% uh, or 90% says fear. Huh? It's all about fear. Next question, who's afraid of the wolf? And that's a much lower percentage. And that's weird. So managers and experts, policy makers and scientists, they often work with assumptions about the public. We think people fear the wolf. Well, do they? And one of the roles I take on as a social scientist, I try to replace assumptions with knowledge by doing social science <coughs> research. And I will give you two examples of that later on. Uh, reflecting back to the wolf issue, it's not about fear. I can give that away already. But first, I want to um, explain why I think human emotions are relevant to consider in conservation and wildlife management contexts. And I do so referring to a Dutch example. This is a picture taken from an area called the Oostvaardersplassen. It's former reclaimed land and it was reserved for future industrial companies. So it was just empty land left alone. And then after 10 years, an uh, ecologist and biologist uh, saw like, oh, this is a beautiful self-regulating self uh, nature area. Let's keep this. Uh, it also was uh, an inspiration for the current rewilding movement uh, in Europe and now elsewhere in the world. Uh, so some large herbivores were brought in, deer, um, wild cattle, wild horses, and the area was fenced, and that's it. We have a beautiful uh, national park now in the Netherlands. But then this happened too, the large herbivores, they did well, they breeded uh, well drastically in spring, and then the next winter there was not enough food for all large herbivores, so um, the weak ones uh, were starving. And this raised concern among the public. And, you know, there was, well, the issue was never resolved between uh, policymakers, managers, and the public. So, in the end, it was like this protesting. Oostvaders Plassen, that's the area, concentration camp, referring to uh, what the Nazis did in the past. Um, and actually, uh, death threats were expressed to the managers of this area. People were afraid, for a good reason. And these people were very angry, maybe for a good reason too. No wonder if you receive a death threat as a wildlife manager or nature conservationist, you start fearing emotions. Huh? You don't like human emotions because look what can happen. Huh? It, it corrupts your life maybe and your work. So emotions are forbidden. Huh? That's, I'm not saying this applies to every individual conservationist or wildlife manager, but this is the general story, the narrative. <coughs> this is also built on a long-standing tradition in, in Western culture, huh? where there is a, where um, emotion a rationality, reason, are seen as opposites. And this is already in the work of Plato. Uh, he calls it pathos and logos. And pathos is the black horse, of course, and logos the white horse. And if pathos wants something different than, than logos wants, then you deviate from the ideal pathway to the future. Uh, this is, uh, in different words, repeated by very influential thinkers such as Kant, uh, Descartes, Freud, and more recently uh, Kahneman, who won a Nobel Prize by, well, his theory making a distinction between fast thinking, more emotionally influenced, and 
slow thinking, more rationally. rationally. So what is the hidden structure? Sometimes not hidden, sometimes it is explicit. Emotion and reason are opposites. And then considering emotion presents a threat to rational thinking because you know, when we let emotions in, referring back to Plato, huh, we deviate from the best decision making about the future. So exclude emotion from decision making. Okay. A comparison. If I ask a conservationist or a wildlife manager, is it important to think about water when you take decisions? Yes, of course, because water is a crucial factor for ecosystems, for, uh, well, everything. Um, and then I ask another question. Do you think that if you think about water, that your thoughts become wet? And then I get a very crazy look like this is the most silly question I ever heard. OK, replace water with emotion. Hmm? So we say water is relevant to conservation. OK, emotion is too, because it happens that people have emotions. They are important in their everyday life. They are important when it comes to motivation. People are important. Conservation is not conservation in a world without people, and so is wildlife management. So emotion is relevant. We should think, therefore, think about emotion. And thinking about emotion does not make our thoughts and our decisions emotional. Not at all. We can very rationally, rationally think about emotion. We can ask ourselves, like, hey, what is the most relevant emotion when it comes to the public and rules? in Europe. That's a very rational thought about emotion. It's even worse because I think our emotional connection with nature or to nature is the rock bottom of conservation. Why do we do conservation? Well, because we love nature in the end. Or maybe we love people and we know that huh, uh, nature is crucial to support the life of people too. At some point, there is an emotional connection. And you know, rational thought is very hard. You have to be motivated. Where does that motivation come from? How do you select what you're going to think about, what you're going to analyze, what you're going to invest your time in? Well, because you feel an emotional connection to something. So excluding emotion, in my view, in the end, is a threat to conservation. The most emotional people are conservationists, actually, when they talk about nature. Just, just watch. Hmm? So why do they have the right to feel emotions towards their object of concern and the public not? Why should the emotions of the public be excluded? I think that's a very good way to decrease public support for conservation. Now, what can a social scientist bring in this context? Uh, just one example, it, both examples are about survey research. So one is modeled after this Osvaldos Plaza case where large herbivores starve during winter because of a lack of food. In that case, 75%, and this was more or less representative as far as is possible these days, 75% of the Dutch population would accept applying contraceptives. The, this was temporary contraceptives uh, in, in this case. Um, and that support was much bigger than support for any other management action we uh, proposed in the survey. Uh, why was that? We also measured people's values toward nature. And usually, uh, there was a long-standing tradition of, of uh, wildlife values. And it seems that some people are more domination-oriented, huh? prioritizing human well-being over wildlife well-being. And other people, we call them mutualists. They uh, have a more egalitarian view about the relationship between humans and, nature, and, and animals. Um, we did not find any difference in mutualist or domination people uh, when it comes to support for temporary contraceptives as a management action. And that's also important. So it seems to be 
less controversial when it comes to conflicting values between people. Um, killing the weak ones, and that was at the time we administered the survey, the management uh, strategy in Osvaders Plassen, that was the least supported management action by the public. So, the current management thinks like this is the best action, and it might be, I, I cannot judge biological, ecological concerns. That might be reasons behind this management action. But what I can know as a social scientist, don't try to convince the public like this is really the best way and they have to support that too. They think differently and it's good to know that. Second example, that's about the wolf. A simple study, it was a student sample, but then I observed that students are people too, so I'm fine with that. It was just a bit theory testing. Um, in contrast to previous research that only addressed fear towards wolves, we just did the whole range of emotions, positive and negative. And we found that positive emotions were more intensely felt by people than negative emotions towards the wolf. So we talk about fear, but people feel other things, more positive things towards the wolf. Lethal control of wolves when there is a problem was not acceptable for the vast majority of students in that questionnaire. And positive emotions were associated with um, acceptability of lethal control. So people who feel more positive emotions are less likely to accept lethal control of rules. But negative emotions were not associated. And I can imagine that. If you fear a wolf or anything, usually fear goes with respect for the thing you fear. So you don't want to kill things that you respect. So fear didn't have any influence on acceptability of lethal control. So key message here, why do we talk about fear huh? as experts, as policy makers? One minute, that's perfect. Um, it's really about other things. Fear has no influence and is hardly felt. Positive emotions are felt, talk about that. Okay, last slide. So takeaway messages. Uh, messages for managers or policy makers or biologists, ecologists working in conservation. Do not fear emotions, be curious and open. The problem in the Oostvaders Plasse is that managers did not listen to people when, when they were sad. They did not listen to them, they were excluded from public debates and then they became angry towards the managers. But it didn't start with anger, it started with sadness towards individual animals. Do not make assumptions about people as an expert. Just realize an expert is really a weird, weird person. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you're educated for five years, you're surrounded, you're in your bubble, you know. Don't think that you think you know anything about normal people. And management interventions, that, that's what we see over and over. Management interventions that solve problems but do not harm animals too much, they are preferred by the public, huh? whatever value structure or emotional relationship people feel, um, and therefore they are likely to be the least controversial uh, actions in terms of the public and you know, societal debates. Thank you for listening and I'm happy to uh, try to answer your questions. Okay, all right. Thank you. That's really interesting. I wondered the, the example you gave of wolves and uh, the, how people felt towards them. Uh, have you, or could you speculate, if you were to do that with farmers or something that uh, feel that they're losing livestock to wolves, how their emotions would map onto those student perceptions and how that might then shape how you would address the issue with them? Yeah, that's a very good question. So these findings are sample specific. That's why I actually said it was students, huh? students of Wageningen University, green-oriented young people, that's very... Although, there are many sons and daughters of farmers too in Wageningen, so I don't even know that this, this sample might reflect it well. But that's a very specific concern, huh? sheep owners in the Netherlands 
or some people who live in uh, the territory of a wolf pack. Like I talked with an old woman and she used to, to, to go running a bit every morning in the woods and she was just afraid, can I do this huh, anymore? So I think we can, on a national level, we can conclude huh, if the sample were representative, huh, but that's just a replication we can easily do with some funding. Um, don't talk so much about fear, but for specific groups, it might be very different. So I would never generalize about specific groups, uh, even based on a representative sample. What I do know, farmers in the Netherlands, it's different. The wolf is not so much, well, I'm, I'm not sure, but I think the biggest problem here is that the wolf is excellent currency in identity politics politics that already existed before the wolf arrived. Farmers against um, um, nature conservationists or people who feel not heard by the government against the green elites. Huh? That's, that's how they think about the government. Although we don't have green governments in the Netherlands, huh? we have right-wing parties, that doesn't matter. Hmm? So it's about other things too, polarization. And then yeah, the wolf is just a symbol. So farmers, they don't want the subsidies to protect their sheep because if they take it, they work with the government. That's what they don't want to do. So it's a very different dynamics, more social than psychological, I would say. We'll, we'll talk during the lunch. Um, <laughs> oh, Martin, uh, we're, um, I'm here as an animal activist yeah. uh, for the Oostvaardersplassen. Mm -hmm. And I um, introduced uh, Professor Stout from the University of Utrecht to the Oostvaardersplassen. And they were saying they're going to listen. But nowadays, uh, we have an appeal, a very large group. And um, they say it's not possible, fertility control. That, sorry, what, what is not possible? It's not possible to, to have a fertility control uh, with the animals. That's okay, but still you can listen to the public and instead of killing the weak ones, you could maybe mm -hmm. treat them well in a nice meadow. Yeah, but what I, wanted to, what, what I wanted to tell you is that the government is really uh, very uh, bad. <laughs> might be, really, might be. Really, 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 really. They, you know they the say thing? they do yeah. all kinds of things, but they do nothing. Yeah, no, but that's a tradition, I think, you know. In the past it was, a, you know, go away with your emotions. Now they say, I understand the emotions, but we have to take rational we decisions without listening to people. Huh? Um, yeah, but um, you know, I'm not an expert when it comes to the case of the Oostvaardersplassen. It's just that we, we use this as an inspiration to model our survey without even mentioning it because it, it, it gives associations in the mind of people. It was just the structure of you know, what's happening there, the structure of the problem. <laughs> 